Well, good morning and welcome to St John's and Clayton Brook. It seems that masks are now a feature of our lives in the UK, uh, not only in shops, but our diocese and the Church of England as a whole are asking us to wear them whenever we're in the building for a church service. However, as I'm the only one in this building right now, I'm going to dispense with the mask. Sorry, you'll have to put up with my ugly mug instead. Um, but whenever you do come to a service, please do uh, try to remember to bring a mask if you can. But for this morning, grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have come together both in person and online in the name of Christ to offer praise and thanksgiving, to hear and to receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. We're going to go straight into our first hymn now. It's brought to us once again by the Watts family. Thank you for all they keep doing. It's Jesus is Lord, the cry that echoes through creation. As we come to our time of confession, Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins with penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us to his image, to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Charlotte is going to bring us our kids slot now and then straight after that we're going to sing our kids song. 
It was a beautiful day. Three brothers decided to go to the beach. They packed their buckets and spades, sun cream and towels, and off they went. The sand was fun, but the sun was so hot. The first brother wanted to go into the sea. He crept to the edge, but the sea looked too scary to go into. I'm not brave enough to swim in that powerful wave. He stayed at the edge and never went in. Soon, the second brother wanted to venture into the sea. Now, he was brave and ran into the sea without even thinking. He swam and he played, but did not pay attention to the sea. He went far out to the sea and the waves got bigger and he did not listen to the waves and he got into trouble and could not swim back. So he needed to shout for help. Help! Help! Now, the third brother went to the sea. He was wise. He played near the sand. And he noticed the waves. He enjoyed the water, but he respected its power. He was not frightened. When the sea became powerful, the third brother listened and knew to come back to the safety of the sand. Today, we talked about the sea. God is like the sea in our story. God is powerful. We shouldn't be scared of him like the first brother. God is strong. So we shouldn't be bold and not listen to God like the second brother. God is great, so we should respect God and listen to him. We should live the way he shows us with respect, like the third brother. To be wise is to respect God. It's a fire and a sword, it's the voice of our Father, the word of the Lord. The blade of the Spirit can cut to the soul, and God will use it. 
It's a light and a hammer, it's a fire and a sword It's the voice of our Father, the word of the Lord The blade of the Spirit can cut through the soul And God will use it to make us whole Well, we begin a new sermon series today looking at the book of Proverbs. And before Philip comes to preach to us, Etel is going to read to us from Proverbs 1 and Proverbs 2. Today's reading is Proverbs chapter 1, from verse 1 to 7, and then chapter 2, from verse 1 to 11. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, King of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose way of life is blameless. For he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you and understanding will guard you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the book of Proverbs. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, as we meet together now, would you open our minds to your wisdom and our hearts to fear of you? We ask this through the name of the one who is our wisdom, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I came across this child's prayer. Dear Lord, please make the bad people good and please make the good people nice. (laughs) We know what she means, don't we? Please make the good people nice. They're good, but something is lacking. Uh, We think of people who are morally upright, but cold. Uh, People who who are very loving to others, but then just get taken for a ride by them. Uh, Someone who's beautiful, but makes bad choices in life. People who are incredibly intelligent, but just can't do life. Even churches, perhaps, where there's been a real sense of revival, a work of the Spirit, and yet they seem to have gone into reverse. What's gone wrong? What has been lacking? And, of course, there's never one answer to these things, but I wonder whether again and again the answer is what is lacking is wisdom, that wonderful quality of wisdom. 
During the week, I came across Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 18, which I don't remember ever noticing before. Uh, It's rather lovely. It speaks there of the teaching of the law by the priest, the word from the prophets, and counsel from the wise. I was very struck with that, that lovely notion of counsel. There are the big matters of the law that the priests give us, how to be right with God. That's the word of the prophets giving us that whole direction from God. But what about the little things of life? Uh, What is a good time to go to bed and get up in the morning? Uh, How should I relate to my neighbors? Should I buy that car? What do I do about my daughter who seems so flirtatious and she's only 12? You know, just the, the ordinary everyday things of life. They're not in the prophets, they're not in the law. We need counsel. We need godly counsel. We need wisdom. Someone talked about godliness in working clothes. That is the world of wisdom, the counsel of the wise. That is the world of Proverbs. As we begin today, just a word of the the, the way the book works, chapters 1 to 9 form the sort of first part of the book, dealing with the the whole matter of wisdom and living wisely. And then from chapter 10 to 31 are the actual Proverbs, the pithy sayings themselves. Proverbs is the book of wisdom in the Bible. It's, It's how life should work. It's not the only book about wisdom, Uh, Very helpfully, we have, for example, the book of Ecclesiastes, which tells us even when we we, we get wisdom, there's still big questions to answer. We have the book of Job that tells us, well, what about when you do live wisely and you do love and fear the Lord and things still go wrong? What then? Uh, The Psalms, which sort of overlap with wisdom literature, help us to engage emotionally and spiritually with this whole notion of living wisely. Proverbs, though, is the sort of central book, the central book of uh, wisdom from God. And I want to read to uh, to you again chapter 1, verses 1 to 7, which in many ways introduce and summarize the book. And then I want to address two questions to think about together. So Proverbs 1, 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance, for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Two questions then. Uh, What is wisdom? And then where can or how can we find wisdom? What is wisdom? Uh, Let me just drop in a a few proverbs, a few favorite proverbs and later in the book. Uh, Here's one. Put your outdoor work in order and get your fields ready. After that, build your house. Great advice, you know, uh, get a decent job and then think about a mortgage. Uh, This one always amuses me. As churning cream produces butter and as twisting the nose produces blood, so stirring up anger produces strife. Uh, Here's one that really goes to the heart. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. We know that, don't we, that the gossip that eats from within. But then listen to this. Uh, Without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down. These are great tips for living, aren't they? I mean, any, any person, believer or unbeliever, could benefit from such good advice. And interestingly, there are Some proverbs that are in the Bible are found in non-biblical literature, and also there is a wealth of non-biblical literature that overlaps with proverbs that has similar good advice for living. Uh, Now, that shouldn't trouble us, and in fact, I want to say that shouldn't surprise us, because if the world is God's world, if he made the world and he made everyone in his image, whether they're believer or unbeliever, then we're going to find wisdom not only in the scriptures, not only among the people of God, but in many different places. And what they seem to give us, these proverbs, what this wisdom seems to give us is uh, 
a way of living life that works. A way of living life that works. It's about how to live life with skill. Uh, here is an illustration which I find, for me, the most helpful, uh, most helpful one of understanding what wisdom is. Uh, here's a piece of wood, uh, and if you look at this wood, you can see there is a grain running along it from the, 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 the rings of the tree. Uh, now, if you want to smooth that out, uh, you can take one of these things, a plane, and you can plane along the wood like that. And you plane, or later you can sand, with the grain. You go along the grain of the wood. If you try to do it the other way around and go across the grain, you just make horrible scratches and you make a mess of your lovely piece of wood. You need to go with the grain. Now, wisdom is about going with the grain of the world, going with the grain of creation, going with the grain of reality. You see, our world is such that reality is given. That's quite countercultural today. We're all into self-identification and creating our own reality. But in the end, that won't work because reality is given. We are born into a pre-made reality, the world, a world which works a certain way because it's made by a creator. And wisdom is to go with that and live with that. So as one example, that's why telling the truth works and telling lies doesn't. Now, that's not always the way, uh, but by and large, the world works that way. Why? Why should it? Why should truth work better than lies? Is there any reason for that? Well, the only reason I can think of is because it's made by a God of truth, and he's woven truth into his world. And wisdom is to work in harmony with that reality. And that's true in all areas of life. As, as you go through the book of Proverbs, working with the grain of the world of work, living a marriage, bringing up our children, the use of our tongue, uh, the use of our time, and so on. Uh, getting it right, that wisdom is to go with the grain of creation. And, and what you see, what wisdom then gives us, to pick up some of the words uh, from verses 1 to 6 we read earlier, uh, insight. Don't you just long uh, time and again for that insight, that understanding? Or prudence, a great word, prudence. Someone described it as good cunning. I like that, good cunning. Uh, knowledge, just knowing the right things. Discretion, often seen in, in its absence. Ah, he just lacked discretion. Uh, guidance. Wouldn't you long for those qualities in your life? Wouldn't you long for your children to grow up with insight, prudence, discretion, wisdom, guidance, and so on? That is what Proverbs offers us. Uh, and the beginning of chapter 2, which is read to us, you get this if and then. My son, if you accept my words, if you call out for insight, if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. Then you will understand what is right and just. Wisdom will get us on that right path, going with the grain of creation. In my own world uh, of, of ministry as a pastor and a minister, as I look at uh, ministers around me and those I know and, and, and myself, and sometimes sort of, there are some who just seem to get it right, and others who may be equally good preachers and may be lovely, godly people in many ways, sometimes very gifted all-rounders, and things go wrong. What's the difference? Again and again, it's a matter of wisdom. I think for myself, where things have gone awry and I've got things wrong, uh, so often it's not been that I was so much wrong, but I wasn't wise. Oh, for that gift of wisdom. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, uh, putting it that way, th this sounds very attractive, doesn't it? I mean, who wouldn't want to have this wisdom? A life that works, success, successful children. We long for these things, don't we? Uh, and if it's about following this, this good advice and these great tips for living, do you need to be a Christian? 
do you need God? Uh, could you not just adopt these things? And I guess to some extent, well, why not? You could. I mean, there is good advice there. But how to stop that becoming mere uh, pragmatism or, or, or self-interest? I'm going to live this way because it works and it'll make me better. Or even manipulation. I'm going to treat people this way because then I will get what I want out of them. And so I want to say, yes, that's wisdom, and it's a great thing, but true wisdom is not only to go with the grain of creation, but also with the grain of the Creator. To be truly wise is not simply to live in line with creation, but to be in the hand of the Creator, the fear of the Lord. And that brings me to our second question, where or how can I find wisdom? And the answer is, in the fear of the Lord. Verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. <clears throat> you may remember the incident where Jesus went back to Nazareth as a grown-up and preached there. And Matthew tells us the people were astonished and they asked one another, where did this man get this wisdom? And the answer surely was from the Lord, from fear of the Lord, from his heavenly Father. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that sense of beginning is not so much you, know, you start with the fear of the Lord and go on from there. More, it's more the sense of the fount or the origin, the source of wisdom. It's from the fear of the Lord, which means the wisdom is not just a matter of the mind and right thinking, not just a matter of the hands and right living, of the mouth and right speaking. It's a matter of the heart and right worship. The, um, the little children's spot that uh, Charlotte and family did earlier uh, very helpfully <clears throat> illustrated fear of the Lord. There was uh, Matthew who was terrified of the sea and wouldn't get in. Uh, there was Andrew who loved the sea and jumped in and uh, didn't respect it and got into trouble. And there was Owen, who loved to play in the water, but treated the sea with the respect it deserves. That is what it means to fear the Lord, to love him and uh, to be confident in him, to want him, but with that awe and respect. I'd never come across before, not knowingly, this passage from Wind in the Willows, where mole and rat meet and pan. It's a, it's a bit of a sort of nature religion, but it beautifully uh, describes fear of the Lord. Let me just read the paragraph to you. <clears throat> it begins with Mole speaking. Rat, he found breath to whisper, shaking. Rat, are you afraid? Afraid, murmured the rat, his eyes shining with unutterable love. Afraid of him? Oh, never, never. And yet, and yet, oh, Mole, I, I am afraid. And then the two animals, crouching to the earth, bowed their heads and did worship. <laughs> That's really got it right, I think. Afraid and yet not afraid. Uh, Jesus said, fear the Lord, but don't be afraid. Uh, the adaptation of Psalm 34, fear him, you saints, and you will then have nothing else to fear. The love or respect of God. It's making God our center of gravity. It's minding his opinion more than anyone else's. That is what it is to fear the Lord. And you see, applying that to wisdom, I can tell the truth because it works, but what about those times when it doesn't, when it doesn't pay? Well, if I fear the Lord, I will still tell the truth. I do right because it's right to do right, because I fear the Lord. Or I could love and care for my wife because then she will love and care for me, and it just kind of works. But what if there's a time when it doesn't work? Well, if I fear the Lord, I will love her as Christ loves the church. Do you see, if, if you're an employer, you can treat your employees well and fairly because you'll get good results out of them. But if you don't get good results, you will still treat them well and fairly, whatever that will mean in your context, because you fear the Lord. Uh, when I fear the Lord, wisdom, uh, instead of being a, a sort of paced-on, 
get results way of living because it works, I do it. Rather, it, it, then bec it becomes a whole approach from the heart out of love for the Lord. We can try, and to some extent we may succeed in bolting on wisdom as an external thing. But when we fear the Lord, it will grow from the heart. And we will begin to think his thoughts after him and live his life after him. It's a beautiful thing, fear of the Lord. Ultimately, the way the Bible is heading, ultimately, true wisdom is personified. It is Jesus. In the words of Paul, he is our wisdom, holiness, and righteousness from God. And true wisdom is to be in Christ, to know him, and therefore for his wisdom to live and dwell in us. Fearing the Lord, coming to Jesus, loving Jesus, that is wisdom. From fear of the Lord, giving us then that prudence, wisdom, discretion, guidance, insight for daily life. That's where Proverbs is taking us. Just a final thought as we finish. Though my big questions, what is wisdom? Where can wisdom be found? But as I was putting this together, the thought came to me, to some extent for myself, that there may be some of us thinking, have I left it too late? Or maybe, I wish I'd known this 20 years ago. Or what about what I did then, the consequences of which I'm still living with today? Well, I want to say to you, it is never too late. Yes, of course, things have happened. There are consequences. There are things that can never be undone. That is reality. But I want to say it's never too late to learn. One of the striking and strong features of the book of Proverbs that we'll come back to is that much of it is addressed from a father to a son. Again and again you get the phrase, my son, listen to me, my son, heed my instruction, don't forget my teaching. Proverbs is especially a book for the young setting out on life. But it is not only that. It is also a book for the mature and it is also a book for the wise. It is never too late to learn. I don't know if I'd noticed this before, but as I was reflecting on this, how struck I was with verse 5 of chapter 1, which says this, Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. You're never too old to learn, and you're never too wise to learn. So I want to say, if you're starting out on life and you've made, in some ways, a bad start, fear the Lord and learn from him. If you're in your mid-40s and there are aspects of your marriage and family life, perhaps, that you wish you'd done differently, you can get wisdom from the Lord. If you're an employer and you've made some bad judgment calls, it's never too late to learn. If you're in your 80s and there are regrets as you look back on life, it's never too late to come to the Lord and to learn. As individuals and as a church family, how great to learn to fear the Lord and in the words of Proverbs, therefore, get wisdom. Let's take a moment of prayer. Just a moment of quiet. If there is a particular issue where you've lacked wisdom, a regret, or where you want wisdom, Take a moment in the quiet to bring that to the Lord now, and then I'll close with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, as we look to you and come to you, our wisdom, would you dwell in our hearts through faith? Would you clothe us with your wisdom? Would you teach us fear of you and to live lives that reflect you and bring this wonderful gift of wisdom into our world? In your name we pray. Amen.
Let's respond to all that we've heard with the words of the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, it's over to Kathy next, who's going to lead us in our prayers of intercession, and then we're going to sing our fourth and final hymn, Name of all majesty. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, as we come before you this day as a church, separate but unified in our love for you, bless each one of us. Thank you, Lord, that we can worship together this day free from persecution. Help each one of us to adjust to the way that our life, life is today and remind us to give thanks to you for all the blessings that you have showered upon us. Oh God, help us to trust you. Help us to know that you are with us. Help us to believe that nothing can separate us from your love revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we entrust to your tender care all those who are ill or in pain, knowing that whenever danger threatens, your everlasting arms are there to hold them safe. Comfort and heal each one of them and restore them to health and strength. We pray for all those who are vulnerable, isolated, housebound and in care homes, away from friends and family. Help us all to be alert to their needs and care for them in their vulnerability. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, give skill, sympathy and resilience to all who are caring for the sick and elderly. Sustain each one of them in their work and protect them from illnesses of their own. We thank you, Lord, for all the people who are working through this crisis to keep our lives safe and keep the wheels of our lives moving. Thank you, Lord, for their willingness to meet our needs and protect each one of them. 
Gracious Lord, give your wisdom to those searching for a cure for this virus. Open their eyes, Lord, so that a way may be found to move forward. Strengthen them with your spirit, that through their work, many will be restored to health. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all those who have lost their lives over the last few months. Gracious Lord, we lift their lives and our memories to you, and we pray for their salvation. We pray for all of those who have lost loved ones and ask that your comfort and peace would enter their lives and ease their grief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the hungry and the homeless here in the UK and across the world. And we give praise for the work of your missions to reach out to people in their need, be it material or spiritual. Lord, we lift up to you the different missions we as a church are supporting. We think of Christians across the world who cannot worship in freedom and give thanks for the work of crosslinks and open doors. We pray for the work of Chorley Street Pastors, the Salvation Army, Tear Fund, Barnabas Fund, the Chorley Street Pastors, the Salvation Army, Tear Fund, Barnabas Fund, the Church's Ministry Amongst Jewish People, the Church Missionary Society, Compassion and Wellfield Church. Gracious Father, we lift up to you today the work of Living Waters in Chorley. And we thank you that we as a church and as individuals have had the privilege of supporting the work of this church in feeding the hungry locally. Lord, it is so easy to be enveloped by our own needs and worries that we forget about the needs of others. Fill us with compassion for the needs of others and prompt us to speak out, to reach out and to gather in for you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for those who are governing our nation at this time. They're shaping policies. Please make them make wise decisions which are in the best interests of the people of this nation. We pray for governments across the world that they may work together for the good of mankind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support the anxious and fearful and lift up all those who are brought low that we may rejoice in your comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And can we join together across our parish to say the words our Lord Jesus Christ taught us? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Well, that's it for this morning's recorded service. It simply remains for me to say, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you.